Good morning. What a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. James, hold your sister. Hold your hand. Now, before I get started and get rolling, does everybody have notes from last week? that they are 
lost. They need something. So they're not left without the gospel message. They're not left without hope. We've already seen through the God awareness and our own conscience that tells us and guides us into right and wrong that nobody's without excuse when they stand before God on trial. Every mouth will be stopped because God has done everything he can to reach that individual from the very beginning to point them to him. You know what? We didn't talk about the conscience last week. We will talk about that this week. We talked about nature and how nature pointed that there was a God. And how we looked at, um, and I know I'm going to get it, that verse that nature testifies that there is a God. We looked at it last week, how creation testifies that God is all-powerful and that there is a greater deity, because this just did not happen by itself. We looked at, what was his name? Cootie. He was in, in the uh, head of the Inca tribe in South America. They worshiped the sun god Idi. But he had doubts that Idi was the supreme god because a single cloud could walk out of Idi's power. So nature testified that there was a god. We also looked at what happens to people who ignore their god consciousness and the fact that nature teaches that there is a God, and how they become a heathen, how they become left in their own ways. We saw that idolaters and homosexuals were lumped in the same spot, um, were lumped together in the Book of Romans. And the Book of Romans informs us that the reason that they fall into the sin of homosexuality, <laughs> why people worship idols, is because they choose not to do the things of God. Because they choose not God, God left them over into their own lusts to do as they please. Worshiping and creating images of four foot feet of bees, things in heaven, things in the earth, but also he allowed them to do those things which were not pleasant or um, the Bible uses the word convenient. If they want to become homosexuals, God and they choose not to obey the word of God, regardless of their conscience, regardless of the word of God, God left them go <coughs> to their own way. And it comes down to the fact that they chose not to honor God in their life. And that's taken from the book of Romans. We read that last week. And because of that, he allowed them to be taken, overtaken by their own desires. And just for reference, it is in your notes, but we're at point five. Steps to becoming a heathen and under um, numeral A, well, letter A, you find it's found in Romans chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. In verse Romans chapter 1 and 21, we find the second step to becoming a heathen, and it's because they chose not to glorify God and worship Him as God. If someone would please read Romans 1, 21. <coughs> So when we look at verse 21, we find what happens when man turns from knowing about God and they refuse to acknowledge him. Their hearts become darkened. They glorify him not. And the reason their hearts become darkened, they glorify him not. But notice that they were not thankful. So because of those two reasons, they wanted nothing to do with God. And God said, all right. That's it. So the second step was, the first step is not acknowledging God as God. And the second step is wanting to do what they wanted to do and refusing to acknowledge the awareness of God. And 
and because of that, he allowed them to become more easily deceived by other gods and ideas. Things, when it comes to sin, it doesn't normally happen quickly and overnight. There are little things that start festering and start popping up. The Bible states it's the little thoughts that spoil the body. And that's exactly what we see is going on here. It began small, but it slowly began to get larger and larger. They wanted nothing to do with God, but yet they began to develop their own ideas, their own things, ideas of and uh, own desires of what they wanted to do. And because of that, they became, God allowed them to be given over to their foolish ideas, to do those things which were in their hearts. And they were dark. They, those things, those ideas, their desires, it darkened their hearts, the Bible says. And we get a glimpse back into the days of Noah, where every man's imaginations were evil continually. Why? Because they chose not to honor God in their minds, and they wanted to do their own desires. So they slowly pushed God aside until they were completely given over onto their foolish ideas and notions. We find that the result is it found in Romans 1, 22 and 23. I know we read that last week, but go ahead and read that again this week, please. Romans 1, 22 and 23. So they chose not to honor God. They turned to their own desires, whether it's slowly or quickly, because we know that there's some quote unquote Christians that claim to be homosexuals, even though it doesn't line up with the Word of God. But they were given over. And we find that once they're given over, the things of God to them are no longer wise. But they're foolish. They, that's exactly it, brother. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And those things which God considers foolish, these individuals are, pro, are considered to be wise. How many times can we look at our own society and see these things popping up where man claims to be smarter than God? Where man claims to know more than God? Well, this is what happened. This is what happened. Let's look at quote-unquote science. There is a difference between man's science and true knowledge. True science. True science will always line up with the Word of God. Whereas man's science will not always line up with the Word of God, but rather man's science will push you more towards man's foolish ideas. Professing themselves to be wise, they became as fools. And because of that, we have theories like the Big Bang, we have theories like evolution. And we've seen this going on and on. And we've even seen it slow. And the problem here is we cannot confuse man's science with God's science. Because them professing themselves to be wise does not always line up with the Word of God. Sometimes it does. The million of years doesn't. And we'll see that when we look at Ken's hand theory over foundations. But when it comes to evolution, it doesn't line up. There are Christians that try to make it line up, and then you get reserved, uh, absurd theories that just go on and on and on. Uh, the one there would be called the gap theory between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, which is completely false. But that's what happens when you try to line up man's science with God's science. It doesn't work. You cannot line up something that is foolish with something that is wise. And that is exactly what's happened here. Men thinking that they are wiser than God, they know more than the scriptures, and they profess themselves as wise. And because of that, we don't need to honor the word of God. We don't need to do that. We don't need to do this. We know, and you almost have that teenage mentality again. We know it all, and that's it. We profess ourselves to be wise, and all the while the pants are standing back shaking their heads. That is the stupidest idea. I have ever heard of. Where'd you even come up with that? Well, so-and-so told me, ah, so-and-so's an idiot. That is not the way it is at all. But professing themselves to be wise, they became as fools. 
And because of that, God gave them over to their own ideas. And thus it is evident that they thought that they could make themselves wise, but as a result, they formed their idea of religion that consisted of idols and heathen practices, and we get cannibalism and human sacrifice, and they try to do things their own way, and it doesn't work. The third light that we're going to talk about is that of conscience. We threw it out this morning because somebody forgot about it and thought they taught on it last week. But they did. So we'll talk about the conscience tonight. Everyone has a conscience. And when we look at the human conscience, it's a guy, not a goat. What's a goat? A goat is a little pointed rod that you force animals into the direction where you're going. God doesn't force anybody to do anything. But he has given us a conscience from the very beginning that tells us what is right and what is wrong. The first time as a little child, when you went to steal that cookie, you probably had something inside of you telling you that is wrong. But you crap, still crap sneak in the hand in the cookie jar. Until mom slapped it down on your head and you got caught. Even as adults, we have a conscience. And it guides us into what is right and what is wrong. If we allow it. The Holy Ghost is a gentleman. He's only going to guide you so many times until you say no too many times, and then he's going to leave you alone. And what happens at that point? Our conscience in that area becomes, the Bible states, as if it was seared by a hot iron. What does that happen to the human body if you sear yourself with a hot iron? You kill the nerves in that area to the point that you can no longer feel anything. I know when I worked at Don's for the summer, I dealt with a lot of hot food. And what do you do in the case? Well, instead of grabbing a rag all the time, I used to pick things up by my fingertips. Well, now my fingertips are a lot less sensitive than they used to be. What happened? That hot stuff sear away some of the nerve endings, or I got used to it, and I'm no longer as sensitive to heat with my fingertips as some people might be. That's what happens to our conscience when we don't allow God to deal with us. There comes a point where we no longer feel Him dealing with us in that area, or He leaves us alone because we've already got our mind made up. Everyone is born with a conscience. Not everyone not any single individual out there, whether they are born under this roof, born in their wealthiest house, are born in a shack in the most remote village that has never seen civilization as we know it. They all have a conscience. And it makes us aware of what we are doing, when we are doing right, and when we are doing wrong. We find that in the book of Romans, chapter 2. If someone please read that. Romans 2, 14 and 15. Romans 2, 14 and 
He did not know God himself. But yet, there was something within him that said, this is wrong. And it bugged him. And it bothered him. And it ate away at him. What? Until he gave back the pot. What is that? That is the conscience at work. Everyone is born with a conscience. And the final light we're going to talk about is the Holy Ghost. So we've seen that nature points us to God. That everyone is born with a God awareness. Everyone is born with a conscience. But the Holy Ghost also is at play in each man's life regardless of where he's at. This is evident in John chapter 16. I'll go ahead and read this. John 16 and verse 8 and verses 10 to 13 as well. So John chapter 16 verse 8 10 and 13 where the Bible states, And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me not of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, he, whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and that he show that he will show you things to come. So when we look at the Holy Ghost, he is the one that guides and directs. And when it comes to salvation, He is the one that guides us into all truth. When we look at the Holy Ghost, He is omnipresent. He is everywhere at one time. Yea, if I ascend to the heavens, and I know I'm misquoting that, Thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, Thou art there. What is that? That is the Holy Ghost. He is, God is everywhere at one time through the Holy Ghost. And He is the one that works on individuals that direct us and point them to God. God said that He would pour out the Spirit upon all flesh. And that includes the heathen. He will deal with them. He will pour, um, guide them into all truth. Do we have any biblical examples of this? Absolutely we do. Of course, I don't have the chapter written down, but in Acts chapter, I want to say it's 9 and 10, we find God, it's not either 9 and 10, it might be 10 and 11, to be honest, the more I think of it. But God is dealing with Peter, and he wants to send Peter somewhere Peter doesn't want to go, because the Jews are God's chosen people, we are the cream of the crop, we're good. And God tells Peter, you know, that which I call clean, don't you call unclean. And that which I call holy, don't you call unholy. Basically, God gives Peter a dream on a rooftop and says, I want you, Peter, to go to the Gentiles. So what does Peter do? All right, God, I'll go. And what does Peter find now? That there is a man named Cornelius that the Holy Ghost has been working on and dealing with. He's been fasting. He's been praying. And when the Holy, when Peter preaches to him, he not only gets saved, Brother Eli, but he gets filled with the Holy Ghost and with power and fire right then and on the spot. And Peter goes back and he tells James and all the other leaders there in Jerusalem, Hey guys, you are not going to believe this one. Not only did the Gentile get saved, but he got filled with the Holy Ghost just like us. And why did that happen? Because God, the Holy Ghost, had already been dealing with Cornelius' heart. Cornelius, before the gospel message was already given to him, he knew what was right and wrong because he had a conscience. He knew what was right and wrong and knew that there was God, uh, someone greater than him, because he had a God awareness already that God had <coughs> He looked around nature and saw that something pointed that there was somebody greater than him. And he was fasting and praying. 
for our names. When Peter came, that's it. And the Holy Ghost was dealing with him and working on him. He gave everything over, and like that, he was saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. When we look at this, we see that the heathen are not off by themselves. We see that every individual has a light pointing them to God. It doesn't matter if they are brought up as a pastor's kid or if they're in the most remote tribe in the world that have not even seen another human being outside of the tribe. They are not void of it. Should they, they die right then and there? They are not void of an excuse. Well, oh God, I didn't know. Well, oh God, I didn't know. God's given everyone several lights that point them to Him. The heathen, and when we look at Cornelius, it just demonstrates that they have the light of the Holy Ghost that guides them to the Gospel. Everyone has the opportunity of either accepting or refusing each one of these four lights. It's their choice. The light of the God consciousness, the light of nature, the light of our own conscience, and the light of the Holy Ghost dealing with us, guiding us into truth. Everyone has the opportunity to either accept it or reject it, which means that everyone will either benefit from it or they will spend their life, um, spend eternity in eternal darkness. The decision is theirs. But the Bible also does state this, that for those that know to do good and do it not, to them it is sin. It also informs us that to the individual that knows more, to a greater judgment they will receive. The heathen who may not have the gospel message will be judged by what light they've been given. But for those of us, if we sit in church, and we know the Word of God. The more we know, the more that we are accountable for. And if we choose not to obey, if we chose to brush it by the wayside, should we not, should we go into eternity not knowing God as our personal Savior, but allowing Him, having Him allow us to go by to our own foolish ideas, and us professing ourselves to be wise, to a greater and sore judgment we will be giving up, given over. We find that in Romans chapter 2 and verse 12. Romans 2, 12. And I'll go ahead and read that for the sake of time. For as many have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. You know, a sore punishment will be given to those who have known to do good and have done it not. Because we've had a revelation of God's will. We've had a revelation of what God desires and requires of us. In conclusion, the church possesses a tremendous responsibility towards the lost, whether they've been in church or not. Christ told each and every single one of his disciples, which is grandfathered into every single Christian. What did he tell us in Mark chapter 16, verse 15? Not to, sit in, not to sit in a pew and just wait until he comes, but to go ye into all the world and <coughs> preach the gospel to every creature. A missionary once wrote a profound statement. He wrote, Some people do not believe in missions. They have no right to believe in missions. They do not believe in Christ. If we truly had a desire to reach people, if we truly knew the gospel, if we truly believe what the Bible informs us of, what God told us in this word, then we would have a greater sense to reach the lost than ever before. Because we know what is coming. That missionary stated that 
Those who do not believe in missions, those who do not reach out to